Good evening and welcome to the Midland Board of Education regularly scheduled meeting on March 12, 2012. Madam Secretary, would you call a roll, please? I'd be happy to. President Malt. Here. Vice President Wasserman. Absent. Uh, Secretary Baker. Treasurer Ole. Here. Member Brandstad. Here. And Member Gordon. Here. And Member Kaminsky. Here. And Mr. Uh, Wasserman may join us. He's not feeling well, but he may join us later uh, in the meeting. So with that, we have a consent agenda. Anybody would like anything removed from the consent agenda or discussed prior to accepting uh, the proposed consent agenda? Hearing none, we'll move to the consent agenda item by item. Approval of the regularly scheduled meeting minutes for Monday, February 27th is included at 2.1. 2.2 is the following books have been presented for a 28-day period of examination. On February 13th, this book was used in English, will be used in seventh grade English. 2.2 is the following staff members have announced that resignation is effective of the date. 2.3 is approval of request authorization of the following legal bills, uh, and that is our consent agenda. Move approval, consent items 2.1 through 2.3. Moved by Mr. Oley, supported by Dr. Kaminsky. All those in favor signify by <coughs> saying aye. 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 Okay, thank you. We will uh, start at this time uh, to request, we have requested here the, uh, to address the board. Uh, Ms. Martinez is uh, the only one on the schedule, and this was because it was sent out Friday. So we'll start with her, and those of you that wish to follow may do so, but please uh, give your name uh, and information to Cindy as you approach the podium. You have five minutes. We'd like you to state your name and address in relationship to the district, uh, if you would, please. Okay, my name is Frances Martinez, and uh, I live at 2903 Lambrose Drive in Midland, and I am the counselor at both Central and Northeast Middle Schools. Uh, when I last addressed the board, it was after hearing that there was a possibility that middle school counseling would be cut in its entirety. I must say I was relieved when I found out that, there was not, that this was not going to be the case, but I was petrified at the prospect of how on earth I was going to serve two buildings adequately. The recommended caseload for counselors is 350 pupils per counselor. I have 1,180 students and all the parents, teachers, and administrators attached to them. Sounds overwhelming, doesn't it? It is. As I was preparing for this talk, I was trying to find my notes from the last time I spoke. I opened my file drawer and saw all these tab headings and it hit me. This is what you need to know. This is some of what middle school counselors do. If I told you everything that we do, all two of us, it would be over my five minutes. Alcohol and drug education. This year, I learned how to conduct a proper search if we suspect that a student is in possession of drugs. I also learned what crack, heroin, and ecstasy look like. Organize big brothers and big sisters mentoring. Organize the reality store. Meep. Oh, the ever-loved meep. Course selection for three grades in two buildings. Educational development plans for all eighth graders at two buildings on a new website run by the state of Michigan that rarely works and is above the reading level of the average eighth grader. Bullying prevention and dealing with bullying that has taken place. It's a law now, you know. Working with students suffering from depression, suicidal ideations, bipolar disorder, panic attacks, autism, and more. Criminal sexual conduct, probate court, being subpoenaed to be a witness in court, study skills, social skills, hygiene talks, those are always a lot of fun, motivation, parenting skills, the list goes on and on. I also have to go from one building to the other if there is an emergency with a child that needs counseling services. I have gone from either central to northeast or northeast to central eight times so far this year. Once was the day before MEEP was to begin. I thought my principal was actually joking when he told me I had to go to Northeast. The issue took three hours to resolve, and I didn't leave work until 8 p.m., having to be back early the next day for MEEP. And I have also had requests to see students at Carpenter and East Lawn. 
because we no longer have counselors in the elementary school. I have recently been diagnosed with matterosis. It's a loss of my eyelashes caused by stress, or as my doctor put it, traumatic insult. I thought that was apropos considering my schedule this year. I also missed three days of work and ended up in the emergency room needing to be treated for dehydration. So if you are wondering if I am overworked, I am. The thing about me though is I love my job. Even though the tasks that I'm supposed to accomplish seem insurmountable, I'm trying my darndest to do the best job possible, and I have never worked so hard in my entire life. Seems kind of odd that I need to follow that statement with, and my salary is being cut. Why is it that we are continually asking our teachers to do more with less while simultaneously cutting our pay? This does not promote a healthy, happy staff, the same staff who are being charged with taking care of our youth. Increasing our workload leads to illness, which leads to loss of teacher work days and increased health care expenses to the district. Midland Public Schools must keep their eye on the prize. What is that prize? doing what's best for kids. When we cut counseling, when we increase class size, when we cut media specialists, when we cut paraprofessional help, when we ask our professional, incredibly talented, and dedicated teaching staff to take a 12% pay cut, we are not doing best what is best for kids. If you ever question how dedicated our MP staff, MPS staff members are, in spite of the pressures we are under, please note that if it weren't for an extremely dedicated teacher arriving to work at 6 a.m., Northeast would be nothing but a pile of ashes blowing in the wind. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christine Swan. I live at 360 West Gordonville, Midland, Michigan. I am a teacher at Central Middle School and a parent of a former Midland Public School student. Kids are my number one job. Not everyone can say that. However, to do my job well, it is necessary to wear a plethora of hats daily. Hat number one. I am their shoulder to cry on when they are having a bad day and can't get in to see the counselor. The cuts made in counselor time at our schools has doubled my time needed in this area. Hat number two necessitates that I am their organizational facilitator when their binders or lockers are about to explode or they can't find any of their papers. Hat number three, I am the remediation expert when they don't initially understand the lesson and need more help. Hat number four, I am their behavior management specialist when they need to improve their behavior. This could require time to meet with parents, meetings with administrators and other teachers, typing up a behavior contract, etc. Hat number five, I am an administrative assistant needing to file papers, make copies, enter grades, print reports, etc. Hat number six requires me to be a data specialist. I need to compare pre and post data, analyze MEEP results, monitor student growth, and flag students who need additional help. Hat number seven, I am a communication expert. Daily there are parent and staff emails to read and respond to as well as phone calls to and from parents. Hats number eight and continuing up from there round off the rest of my teaching duties, such as grading papers, making seating charts, designing lessons, going to meetings, creating district assessments and curriculum, attending trainings, and much more. As you can tell from the long list of job duties, I am a hard worker who puts kids first. As a dedicated teacher, I deserve respect for what I do. Taking the kinds of concessions the district is demanding is a slap in the face. This year I was put into a new position, seventh grade English, and required to do extra work designing lessons and units that should have been done and already in place. I didn't get a new job title of associate superintendent of anything and get a new job created just for me. I was given 
extra work to do with my new position, but unlike the associate superintendents, I wasn't given an over 10% raise for my extra duties. Instead, I am being threatened with a pay cut of 12%. I have already lost money the last two years with a pay freeze because of no contract and an increase of 3% that I was ordered by the state of Michigan to pay additionally into my retirement that I may never see the benefits of. Furthermore, the district wants to increase the number of students in our already cramped classrooms, which means less one-on-one -on -one time for students and additional work for each individual teacher. How much more can a non-associate superintendent take? What do you think will happen to the small businesses in Midland that teachers shop at if they have to take that severe of a pay cut? Over 500 teachers who live in and support the Midland community would have to cut out all but the necessities. Activities at the community center would end. Dinner at Munchies or Traverse Pie Company would cease. Extra insurance policies at Yider would disappear. Subscriptions to Midland Daily News would stop, just to mention a few. The impact to the community would be immense. It would be a detriment to this community for MPS to force these cuts. They operate a lowest bidder mentality and invest nothing in the community, unlike the teachers who shop at local stores. The teachers understand that the district needs to reduce some spending right now, that we are not getting as much funding as in the past. Our association has worked tirelessly to come up with some permanent and temporary solutions that would save the district over four million, but the district says no. They want permanent wage reductions, even if future per pupil funding increases from the state. Every year they are putting money into their savings account, but crying, we're going to go bankrupt soon. They are asking students to make do with less because they are crying, we are going to go bankrupt soon. They are asking teachers to, to do more and make less because they are crying, we are going to go bankrupt soon. They want to increase class sizes for the same reason. It doesn't make sense to me fiscally. At some point, you guys need to realize what we're all worth. My name is Nancy Bussino. I live at 5301 Plainfield. I'm a Midland High School graduate. I'm also a parent of uh, two boys who graduated from Midland Schools, and my daughter's currently at Midland High, and I'm a counselor at Midland High. 26 years ago, when I first started teaching, I was excited to be in my first classroom. And I'm sorry, I'm going to cry through the whole thing. That meant I was going to be a part of a team whose main goal was to be the student and their needs. I was thrilled to be a teacher and looking forward to a rewarding career with kids. Fifteen years ago, when I started teaching here in Midland, that meant I was going to be part of a team whose goal was the student and their needs, and I was going to be in a school system that was one of the best around. And everyone worked together, cared for one another, did what was best for their employees, and regarded the students as number one. I was excited to be back in my hometown where I went to school and my children would be going to school. I felt like part of a team that cared for each other and wanted the best for its students. I love going to work every day. Six years ago, I went from the classroom to the counseling center. For me, that meant I was going to be able to reach out to even more students. I was looking forward to working with and helping students both in and out of the classroom. At Midland High, we had a great counseling staff that worked really well together, both with each other, together, the teachers and the administrators. I love my team and my job and working with kids. About three years ago, we all had pay cuts. What that meant to me was tightening up the budget a bit, like everyone else. I was working in a school I enjoyed and a career I loved. Things were tight, but I still felt like we were all in this boat together. Then just two years ago, we had a bomb dropped on us in the counseling center, and we were cut counselors drastically. I went from 300 to over 500 students. What that meant was not only a ton more responsibility, 
but I could no longer see students like I used to. I felt like what was more important to administrators was test scores and dollar signs. It breaks my heart that I don't have time to talk to students who come to me with a broken heart or nervous about a test or the mom just got diagnosed with breast cancer. I was exhausted trying to take on so much more, but I remembered why I went into this career for the kids and I'm gonna do my best and I'm gonna try to like my job. Now we're being told we're gonna be getting significant pay cuts. What that means to me is more than just tightening my budget. It means telling my daughter who attends Midland High, you can't be a cheerleader or play soccer anymore because I can't afford those athletic fees and the cost to play a sport. What that means to me and my family is that my house goes up for sale and I pray I can sell it because I can't take a seven to 800 month pay cut. I won't be able to make ends meet. I'm a single mom, my income is it. What this means to me is a career I was so excited about 26 years ago and loved for so long, so stressful I don't like it anymore. The stress of unrealistic numbers of the students to the point I can't meet their needs and I feel like I'm not there for them. And the significant pay cuts to the point that my family is gonna lose their home. I don't understand why such drastic cuts when we're not in dire straits and, and some people are getting pay raises. I no longer feel like I'm a part of a team that works together and looks out after their employees and that the students regarded the most important. I chose to go next because Nancy Boston was my daughter and I don't cry. <laughs> but my name is Thomas Deitch. I live at 5315 Dale Street. I graduated, I attended Midland Public Schools. I went through K through 12, graduated in 1954. After graduation, I spent four years in the United States Air Force. After my service time, I attended many schools to prepare myself for a career, which I think Midland Public Schools should be doing. After my service time, I attended many schools to prepare myself. And at that time, after I prepared myself and it came, I came to work for Midland Public Schools. I worked here for 35 years and retired as manager of maintenance development. Through my years as a student here and as an employee, I've always known Midland Public Schools to be regarded as one of the best state <coughs> schools in the state. The part about MPS and departments had been the top of the list. We were fortunate at that time. We had great staff, administrators, school board members, and the whole team was aware that we had to work together, which I don't see much of anymore when I observe. <clears throat> Each student was number one. The reason we're here, people, is because of students who these people take care of. Not what you people do or not what you people do, what these people do. That's how we get things done. I think we have lost the number one spot. And as I look back and what's happened, we had a great custodial staff that we had a uh, administrative staff that didn't understand what they did and how much they did. So we decided to replace them. I was told I only had five minutes and I can only cover a couple things I like to talk about. But anyway, when we took those people away, we were told we had a miracle crew coming in and they're gonna do the cleaning. Well, if anyone goes out in the buildings and looks at what our buildings look like now, you sure can't be proud of what you see out there. After 35 years, what I had to observe and see, you don't see it now. The buildings, if you go, I can give you an example. A few years back at Plymouth School, there was enough dirt under the carpet, and the kids had dropped uh, bird seed, and the seeds were growing. You had a little gray growth out there. So when you took that away, if you knew what they really did out in the buildings, and I think you might know, Rick, that what these kids, these people did, they talk to the people, they're an ambassador out there, and they're the ones that set up for the plays the next day, the carnivals, and what have you. The current staff does not do that. They go from just the surface of the floor. The cleaning custodians clean from the floor to the ceiling and down the halls. 
that don't happen anymore. I'll take you to a lot of the bathrooms. I've talked to Carl about it. The urine smell can be atrocious in some of our bathrooms. That should not be, that's not hygienic. So to maintain a clean and healthy atmosphere which students should have, you better think about backing up and back, correcting your problem. I thought when the staff that did that left, we might have somebody come in and do that. I see we're not doing that. We don't recognize what they did. So that's enough time on that. Let me go to my next, which is, is equally important. I hear these young people talking about what's happening to counselors, teachers, and what have you. Those are the people. You people are the policy makers. You are the people that see that the thing should get done. These are the people that make it happen because they're out there where it's going on. And by not working with them, I have watched our system grow. We have lost a good share of what we teach. We don't have enough classes out there to do a complete career path for our students. I relate to like shop classes and such. We don't do that anymore. And when you don't do that, that takes the tools away from these people, like the uh, counselors and such. If a student comes in, I worked with my tech and different companies to help these people. But a student comes in and sets up a career program, how do you tell them where to go to take a class to prepare for it? You don't provide it. So what you should be doing is to get middle and public schools back on track is to start looking at what's going on in the community. The community is very cooperative here and work with them people, find out what's needed, not only here in Midland, but throughout the country. And if you take some people and work with these people, because they can talk to you about what has to be done. And along with that, if you're not uh, keeping up with that, you don't know what's going on. And we have some staff that, in my opinion, from what I have observed, as administrators, probably shouldn't be here anymore, because I don't think they understand that. So I see my time's running out, I would suggest that I'd like to have all the board members and administrators go home tonight and take a long look in the mirror and ask yourself, am I qualified to do the job I've been assigned here to do? And if you can answer that properly and can clear the world that you are, think about it, but I would doubt it. And I said, you're gonna be thinking about the students. And I would ask the public, as you're gonna put on TV, is a public of Midland, are you happy with what you're seeing? Because I am not. So you go home tonight and take a long look in the mirror and see what you think. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mary Ann DeRocher. I live at 3600 Leonard Lane um, in Midland. I am not a teacher. I am a social worker, and I work in Bay County. Um, I'm here with Alan Chapel. He's a Midland High School teacher, and we share our life together. As a social worker, I understand the concept of dwindling resources and decreased revenue, and I respect the difficult decisions you must make on a regular basis. But I'm not here to discuss spreadsheets. Living with Alan, I know that he's at school by 7. He doesn't leave until 4.30 or 5. He works through his lunch. He comes home just long enough to eat dinner before he starts grading papers, preparing for labs, even if that means the two of us put on waders and go out to the swamp and fill up pickle jars with swamp water for, and take them back to the lab. But I'm not here to talk about teachers' hours either. As of February 17th this year, I had an appointment with an IVF specialist. When Alan came home on February 21st, after hearing about a 12% pay cut, I had to cancel the appointment I had with the IVF specialist. I want you to see me, know my name, know that I'm not a teacher, but these cuts affect me. I specialize in infant mental health, and I do understand Michigan's, the whole state's grim economic future. I see it every day when the moms I work with bring home babies. I know that I can't. I'll keep this short. This past summer I was at the Tridge and I saw um, some teachers and other community members working on petitions. And I saw a man walk by and heckle the people that were gathering signatures and said, nothing but a bunch of crying, whining teachers. 
And if I see that man, I'll make sure that I'll tell him that there is no crying or whining at my house. There wasn't then. There's not now. And it seems as if there will not be if the 12% cut goes through. Again, I'm not a teacher, but this cut affects me too. Alan and I went to college. We both have master's degrees. We own a home, and we've always been responsible and done what we thought we should do to achieve the American dream. This 12% cut takes away my chance of having a child. Thank you. Good evening. My name is John Mulvaney. I live at 735 Ireland Lane. I have worked at the district 14 years as a social studies teacher at Midland High. I have two daughters, an eight-year-old at Plymouth and a 15-year-old at Midland High. I am here tonight to encourage the board to work with the MCA to finalize a contract reflecting the recommendations in the fact-finding report. As a professional of this district, my family has been affected by both state and local changes resulting in many concessions. Teachers have already made sacrifices in our personal and professional lives. And I am personally willing to support further concessions as, as highlighted by the association and the fact finder. I am willing to do this to help students continue to experience the one of a kind educational experience available at MPS. As a parent of two students in this district, my children have also been affected by both state and local events. I have heard that the district is intent on creating systemic structural change to the finances of MPS. Times are changing and teachers are willing to be partners in cost-cutting measures. Teachers have not only offered concessions in the millions of dollars, but also a formula to help MPS if the state cuts per pupil funding again. This and other concessions were not accepted by the district. MPS has tried to bring about systemic change by decreasing paraprofessional hours, decreasing funding for student extracurriculars, privatizing various services, closing schools, proposing to increase class sizes, and many other strategies. None of these changes occur in a vacuum. They build on each other, leading to a tipping point that I believe will affect the overall education of MPS students. I like the structure and system that has evolved at MPS over the past decades, ensuring my children and yours the opportunity for a very high quality education. If the system continues to be weakened, when does it result in a structural change in the level of education MPS children receive? I believe the risk of this happening has increased in the past few years. My children are school of choice, and I choose for them to attend MPS because of the skilled, caring educators and the proven successful programs, not because of a new computer lab or parking lot. Our greatest strength is in our people. MPS students regularly perform at such a high level, it is difficult to find any other district to compare us to. That's a good thing. That's a good system. I regularly watch board meetings, and it is a prideful moment when MPS programs are congratulated on achieving high success. At the last meeting, the MHS Drama Club was recognized as being first in the state for its competition play. The DHS Jazz Band was recognized for an amazing performance. The students, of course, are the primary actors in these activities, greatly deserving of the praise offered them. But so are their advisors, who are usually also their teachers. And yes, the advisors and teachers are thanked effusively for their efforts in continuing the education of MPS students and then are asked to do it all for 12% less. It is damaging to the spirit to hear praise for one's hard work at one moment and a request to do it for thousands of dollars less in the other. Many teachers are willing to continue to make even greater sacrifices to ensure the strength of Midland Public Schools. Please don't ask us to do more than is needed. The fact-finding report seems to have illustrated what these needs are. Again, as an employee, but also as a parent, make a choice to strengthen the structure and system that makes MPS great. I encourage you to work along with the MCA 
to finalize a contract reflecting the recommendations in the report. Thank you. Hi, my name is Patricia Clancy. I live at 1910 Westbury Court. I'm the parent of three Midland Public School students, um, two at Adams Elementary and one at Northeast. I'm here tonight because I feel that the high quality of education on which MPS prides itself is being put at risk through decisions of the board that do not put the needs of children first. I am a first grade teacher at Eastlawn Elementary, but because the board has eliminated media specialists, I am also my student's media specialist. The board has taken away elementary counselors, so I am also my student's counselor. You have cut reading recovery, so I am also my student's intervention specialist. <laughs> You have eliminated the gifted and talented program, so I am the gifted and talented teacher too. You have decided to take paraprofessionals out of our classrooms, so I am usually the only adult in the room to meet the needs of the six and seven year olds placed in my care. And don't forget that I am a first grade teacher delivering high quality first grade instruction to my students. Every role your decisions have added to my plate compromises the quality of services I can deliver to myth and public school students. Your most recent proposal to add even more children to each class means the teacher's attentions will be divided even further. We will be less able to give each child the quality of education and instruction he or she deserves. Please make the right decision. Put children's needs first. Settle a contract with Midland, Midland teachers that is fair equitable, and does not include an increase in class size maximums. Thank you. Good evening. My name is not Charles Darwin. I just look like him. I'm Mark Camillary. I do not live on the Galapagos Islands. I live at uh, 1299 South Nine Mile Road. I'll put a plug in for you, uh, L. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the board for allowing us to speak tonight, and you've been generous about doing that for as long as I've worked for you, so I appreciate that. I want you to also know that I'm very proud to be, um, to serve in this community as one of the, some of the finest teachers and educators that the state of Michigan can provide. And I pre appreciate the uh, many years of gainful employment that you've allowed me to serve, uh, to provide for me um, a, f a life for my family that uh, is middle class, but it's a comfortable life, and I appreciate that. I only hope that that can be the thing that uh, my colleagues in the future are going to be able to also come up here and, and say um, in time. I want to thank you also for the opportunity to uh, walk into my classroom on a daily basis to inspire those kids, to challenge those kids, to encourage those kids, motivate them and prepare them for higher education and to be productive members of our society. And I know that I'm looking at a number of people that uh, I've had a, um, a, the blessing to be able to work with your, your kids in my class, and I appreciate that. So I put together a few thoughts based on uh, the potential of taking a 12% hit uh, as teachers, and also um, I want to look at this from two different perspectives, new, new teachers and the old farts like me that are uh, about ready to bail in a few years. Uh, first of all, Many of my MCEA colleagues will experience huge financial challenges if the district is to impose up to 12% reductions in their incomes. Several of my colleagues that I've talked to uh, could potentially lose their homes. My good friend Nancy Busno already indicated that she probably will if that is uh, what she's going to endure because they're not going to be able to pay their mortgages. Others will need to liquidate their assets just to maintain the budgets that they're currently on. Daycare, college tuition, and retirement investments will also feel the effects of this drastic reduction in income. I've been uh, kind of listening around the dinner table uh, at work to some of the stories that my colleagues have shared uh, with our concerns. And uh, one young lady that I won't use her name um, had a real neat series of stories the other day, but uh, it was kind of neat because she says, uh, as a new teacher, she was led to believe by this um, school district that um, based on the MPS salary schedule, it would be to her advantage 
looking at that salary schedule to get her master's degree as soon as possible. And so she did what most of us have done. We go on to get more education that we pay out of our pockets in the hopes that um, she would be able to pay the tuition back in her student loans within five to seven years so she could start a family and potentially buy a home. Uh, she told me that uh, she invested over the last couple of years, and she's only been teaching for a couple of years, $16,574.40 on just her college tuition. That's not including the books uh, to earn this master's degree, which she did earn. Uh, she calculated that if the imposed reductions are made, she will earn, because of all that effort she put in to get this master's degree, she's going to make a whopping $7 per pay period as an increase if this 12% hit takes place. And uh, it could be even more than that. It might be just a little bit more than $7. And right now, her monthly uh, student loans are $330 that she has to start paying back. So how's that $7 or $14 going to cover that per month is beyond her. <laughs> she already works another job, try to make those ends meet. Her and her husband live in an 800-square-foot home. That's about the size of a big shed. And that's all they can afford. Many new teachers are also working two to three extra jobs just to keep up with the cost of living. This same young teacher is diligent about cutting coupons. She's known as a coupon queen to, um, to have enough money to pay for at least half of her grocery bills. And then it's kind of funny because she says, and I don't even buy the real Doritos <laughs> or the soft ply toilet paper. I get the cheap stuff. Uh, so she wonders, how is it possible to have a master's degree and to struggle so much to afford basic necessities? And, uh, you know, I think you guys need to remember that we are not overpaid. This is not a, uh, this is a nonprofit business that we're all in. Uh, we're not banks. We don't bank money. We shouldn't be banking money. Uh, we don't get bonus checks. We don't get to enjoy profit sharing uh, checks. We don't get stock options. We get what you guys tell us we get, and that's it. And that's what we base our are living on. Uh, so we don't have a lot of extra revenue. As a re uh, person that's getting closer to the other end of the spectrum, many teachers are at the end of their careers and are still helping their kids in college. They're trying to make some financial uh, investments in their 401k so they can be secure in their retirement. They're trying to pay off their mortgages based on their current income. Uh, for me, I got two boys that are still in college at uh, at a cost of over $20,000 per year. Both of my boys work all summer. They work part-time jobs. They work the weekends. They earn scholarships, and still that's a stress on our family. I'm going to have to flip a coin because if I take a 12% hit, it's going to mean that one of you get to go to college, the other one doesn't because I can afford to help at the rate I'm making right now, both of you a little bit. Um, so that's not going to be an option. My wife and I have planned very carefully to help our children in college. Uh, so that they would not have a financial burden to look forward to after they graduated. I, too, am going to need to pursue extra additional income. Uh, currently, I have a hobby called taxidermy that I make a little bit of money. I'm looking at pursuing that as a full-time business. I turn down lots of work because I spend a lot of time at Midland Public Schools uh, to work with my students after school on weekends over the summertime. I don't, I don't hold back from the kids. They come first. But that's going to have to change. Here's some things that uh, our union has suggested. I want this to be on record. Uh, we've offered back two furlough days at about a half a percent each day. That's a 1% give back to you. Uh, we are going to give up. We offered to give back to you our master's plus 15 step, and that means that we'll have to go another five classes or so to be able before you can get your pay raise. So that's a huge uh, cut for our uh, members. Uh, we uh, also contribute to the self-funded insurance beyond what most administrators are willing to, to uh, give back. Uh, we offered formulas to reduce the salary up to 2% on the actual revenues, not the projected ones. Uh, there's no cost of living. We've had no cost of living since 2010. At that time, it was only uh, half a percent. These concessions would save the district between 3 and a and $4.5 million. Um, the third party that uh, Mr. Mulvaney already referred to, the fact finder, suggests that uh, you would take no more than 3% total from our salaries and no more th than a 3% hit on our health care. That's 6%. That's a lot, but it's not 12. Uh, most of us could probably do a lot better with a 6% hit than a 12. Uh, and also no more kids in our classes. They're, they're bursting at the seams. There's a lot of other things I could say. Uh, I just want to make sure that we are all 
uh, in the same boat with this. Midland Public Schools has always attracted the best and the brightest candidates to fill the teaching positions to serve our children in this district. And I don't know how you're going to maintain that if you are going to offer the salaries that you're projecting with this 12% hit. Um, people are going to look other places, and you're not going to get the quality that you are so accustomed to enjoying. So I want you to make sure that uh, you know you keep all that in mind. Uh, what's coming down the pike is maybe not what you're uh, accustomed to if that's the uh, way that you're going to adjust salaries and benefit packages. And I want you to also think about how this impacts our community. Mortgage companies, where we're going to have to not be able to uh, pay our mortgages and foreclose on mortgages, investment companies, car dealerships, restaurants, and other charitable organizations that these um, members in the MCEA are supporting and funding. So it, uh, it affects more than just the pockets of our, of our, uh, of our members. So I want to thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to the next several years of uh, serving this district uh, in the same capacity that I've always, and I'm, I sure I, I'm sure I speak for my colleagues as well. Anyone else in the audience, please? If not, we will close our public comments move on to our uh, Board of Education Matters with Mr. Ellinger. Uh, fairly brief superintendent's report um, tonight out of respect for the number of speakers. We weren't sure how many to expect. Um, on Friday afternoon, the 17th of February, the district provided a session on education on popular drugs found in schools and the community. This event was the result of a summer Midland Partnership for Drug-Free Youth Coalition meeting. Many MPS teachers and administrators attended the meeting. In addition to out-of-county and community members, the event was informative and especially moving with two recent MPS graduates speaking from personal experience. Uh, Mr. Verlindi recently attended a Michigan Institute for Educational Management conference on February 29th entitled Educator Evaluations, Integrating Student Growth Data. On February 29th at Midland High, Mrs. Marlene Searles held an informational night for all MPS 2012-13 juniors and seniors interested in obtaining information about the Great Lakes Bay early college option <coughs> that we'd be into for the second year in a row next year. Um, last week, a group of MPS staff members, administrators, and teachers, including Mr. Verlindi, Dr. Ellison, Chris Sabrin, Cott, Scott Cochran, and Bob Paris attended a Michigan Association of Computer Users in Learning Conference in Grand Rapids entitled Empowering Innovation. We had 21 staff attend that in order for us to continue moving technology down the path that keeps us a, a, one of those cutting edge progressive districts. Mrs. Klein attended a healthcare reform compliance conference. Um, healthcare, as we all know, is very, very complicated. The implications for our district are considerable. Um, if we misinterpret what that uh, new healthcare reform would imply for us, uh, that was at the Birmingham Conference Center down in Southeast Michigan on March 8th. Um, I met for the monthly meeting of the, as a board member of the Legacy Center for Community Success. Uh, there's a lot of ongoing dialogue between what that group can do to support youth here in the community, especially with regard to the youth master plan that's very active um, in the whole county. And then just as an update, um, we had a PD day. Most of our teachers know that here um, in the room with us tonight. Uh, this was a non-attendance day. Uh, we released some staff to uh, continue working on their rooms. We had five rooms damaged by the fire um, last week. That was a tragic event for us. Um, one room is fire damaged. Another room has enough damage that it's going to be a number of weeks before we can move into those two rooms. The other three classrooms we intend to hold with students beginning tomorrow. I think that was the update, uh, unless that had changed. Um, there's a slight smell of smoke in the uh, building. The cleanup crew that we hired did an incredible job with it. Uh, some strong leads um, that are out there. Uh, we have our uh, fingers crossed that we'll be able to turn up um, the arsonist because it was considered an arson. And I'll keep the board and our community informed as is appropriate to do so. And then uh, we had an interesting afternoon here Friday, or I guess it was, yeah, I guess it was Friday um, afternoon. I was meeting with the study committee of the board where we had a power outage. And we blew a transformer here on this site. Uh, that created problems for our internet service and how we communicate uh, throughout the evening. 
I have to tell you that uh, our tech staff, including Jerry Taylor, the backroom fellows, work for 36 hours straight, uh, some of them longer than that. And then some of them, along with Mrs. Klein, uh, were back at it Saturday meeting with the uh, insurance adjusters on uh, Saturday um, over at Northeast. So uh, that was a busy day for our tech staff and a number of folks here in the district. So our heart goes out to the staff as well as the kids at Northeast. That could have been much, much worse. There are firewalls at the end of the hallway. Chances are that fire would have been contained, but the damage could have been much worse. We would end, end, we've been told the damage could, around, could amount to around $100,000, so uh, much more than the 30000 we initially diagnosed in the first day or two. Superintendent's report for this evening. Thank you. And before I go into my Administrative Services Committee report, uh, I just want to let those um, watching us at home and those in the audience here that we will be going to closed session for purposes of negotiations um, after this uh, the public hearing our public meeting and we will be not returning to a public meeting for any matters to be dealt with by the board so with that uh, we'll move into the administrative uh, uh, services committee and that's uh, my uh, committee and my report uh, we met last Thursday um, despite the power outage and uh, went through several policies, uh, starting with the 3,000 professional staff policies that we'll be reviewing in that process. The section will be presented to the full board for adoption at a future Board of Education meeting. Uh, we actually meet again tomorrow evening from 5 till whenever, um, but I think maybe for at least a couple hours, reviewing uh, uh, policies uh, beginning with uh, 3122. A very tedious um, process, and I thank Mrs. Branstad and Mrs. Baker for being on that committee with me and, and, and going through those policies. Uh, with that, we'll move to the curriculum instructions with uh, Dr. Ellison, and I think we have a committee report. Sure do. Mr. Dr. Kaminsky. Uh, we met on Monday, February 27th. Uh, the members were present were myself, Ms. Baker, Carl Ellinger, Kathy Ellison, and Gary Verlindi. We met at Chestnut Hill Elementary. Uh, first topic was ICT instructional consultation team. ICT facilita facilitators Bob Paris, uh, Gay Abibi, uh, Carol Brown, and Lisa Holman provided a presentation that explained the current response to intervention uh, process used by Midland Public Schools. Uh, the IC facilitators are currently funded through a grant by uh, the Herbert H. and Grace A. Dow Foundation. The grant has covered the first three years of implementation and will continue for two more years uh, to provide support to develop a systematic problem-solving process in the district to help support at-risk learners and reduce the number of students identified with a learning disability. The facilitators presented a PowerPoint presentation that outlined the process for identifying students that need assistance. Uh, the facilitators outlined the IC process and the process for teachers requesting assistance from a case manager to collaboratively problem solve on issues related to student academic and behavioral difficulties. The ICT process follow, allows for a focus on what children can do and what instructional conditions we need to create for students to have academic success. There were teacher testimonies from Beth Quimby, Deb Kaiser, Mary Smith, and Amanda Van Huy. The teachers also answered follow-up questions that were asked by the committee members. Um, we also covered uh, testing uh, for Explore and Plan, Bob Cooper, Mathematics and Testing Coordinator, provided a brief overview of MPS participation in this testing. Our next meeting is April 16th. Thank you, Dr. Kaminsky. Anything to add, Dr. Ellison? Okay, with that, we will move on to finance with Mrs. Klein and, you have a, and Mr. Oley's study report. Sorry. Yep, let me review the minutes. They're a little bit longer than normal here. I don't remember the exact time, but I think we were probably spent for three hours or so. Was it four hours? When you get to three or four, I kind of lose track. A long meeting, but very good meeting. Um, Dave Costas um, joined the committee at the beginning of the meeting to review where we are with this summer sinking fund projects. We had a lot of discussion about that. He also provided a list of capital projects that should be considered for the next 10 years. So we spent a fair amount of time discussing the pros and cons of postponing the summer's projects until decisions made regarding a future sinking fund. Uh, Carol reviewed the January financial reports, which were included in our consent agenda for our February 27th meeting. Uh, Mr. Wasserman provided information on an account at a local credit union paying higher interest rates than we currently received, and uh, Carol did uh, follow up after that and contacted the credit union to discover that they don't handle business or government accounts, but nevertheless a good idea worth pursuing. 
Upcoming agenda items will include the recommendations of bids for classroom projectors for Adams Elementary and for providing a wireless access in all instructional areas throughout the district. These will complete the fun projects funded by the multi-year technology grant. Mrs. Klein shared a draft of the service consolidation plan that the district agreed to develop as one of the financial best practices that qualifies us to receive $100 per pupil this year. She noted that in addition to collaborative arrangements with other districts, we have many productive partnerships with the city and county as well with private entities such as the Midland Community Center. Following up on comments made during the mid-year budget revision, Mrs. Klein provided examples of the effects of delaying steps and the MIPSER's offset payments on future budget increases. Both reduce expenses in the current year but require larger increases than usually budgeted in future years. Mrs. Klein clarified the governor's proposal to provide incentives for best practices and achievement. And although the amount for best practices has been estimated at $75 per pupil, the actual amount will depend on how much of the money is needed to fund the achievement incentive. Since the achievement incentive depends in part on a test that won't be taken until March, we may not know when we adopt the budget, whether we qualify or how much will be available to fund the best practices incentive. Committee members advise Mrs. Klein to be very cautious about the amounts included in the 12-13 budget for these items. Mr. Ellinger engaged the group in a lively and lengthy, emphasized lengthy discussion on capital needs, technology, and future millage requests. Mrs. Klein provided a chart showing the current millet rates, the amounts raised by each in the years of expiration. During the discussion, the following questions were raised. Number one, what was the levy for the plant repair, maintenance, and equipment millage that the district was permitted to have until the passage of Proposal A? A few of us remember those days. Uh, the answer to that was 0.63 mills, which at the current taxable values would raise 1.6 million each year. This is less than 1% of the replacement cost of our buildings. And question number two, are there time limits on bonds for technology? i.e., can the bond duration exceed the useful life of the purchase? And the answer, uh, the follow-up answer was, it appears that the time restrictions apply only if qualifying for the school bond loan fund. We will need to get a definitive answer from Bond Council before proceeding with a technology bond. And more to come on this, and the board will be involved in those discussions at a future Board of Education meeting. We will not be having a meeting in March. Uh, next regular meeting will be in April, and copies of the minutes are available for everybody on the public. So long meeting, very good meeting. I appreciate the staff and appreciate all the board members who uh, spent an extraordinary amount of time at the committee meeting. So that was it. Thank you, Mr. Oley. Mrs. Klein. Good evening. Uh, it's been hard to ignore the drumming of the rain on the roof and the thunder. And just as an update, the tornado warning that went into effect shortly before the meeting for Northern Mid Midland County has expired. We are not currently under any warnings. We, the tornado watch <laughs> that's in effect until 11 is still in effect. And this appears to be a, a cell moving through, and it should clear up sometime probably within the next half hour or so. Uh, with that, let's move to the gifts. And they total $4,721.96. <coughs> Donors are the Adams PTO the East Lawn Elementary Student Supplemental Educational Endowment Fund at the Midland Area Community Foundation. They had two separate gifts. Uh, then a very special gift, it was the Max Melki Memorial. Uh, Mr. Melki was a longtime art teacher for Midland Public Schools and spent quite a bit of time at Northeast. And uh, upon his passing, his widow Martha decided to de dedicate the donations that were given toward a project in the schools and it was determined that uh, through working with the art staff that <coughs> replacing the sink in the art room at Northeast would be the most fitting tribute for him. So we're, we're very pleased to see that and it, it's always nice to honor someone who spent so much of their career here. Uh, we also have a gift from Charles Thornton in memory of Sherry Thornton and that is to benefit the Media Center at Seabird Elementary. Midland High School Athletic Booster Club, and then a second grant from the East Lawn Fund at the Community Foundation. Uh, none of them require your approval. They're all relatively small regarding as far as the amount in board policy, so therefore your information only. Thank you. Mr. Verlindi in <coughs> HR. Yes, <coughs> we have one memorial uh, for information and then also some uh, retirement announcements. Uh, the board and staff extend their deepest sympathy to the family of Mr. Lester Dankert, who passed away on February 27th. He served as a member of the Milton Public Schools Board of Education for 12 years, from 1955 through 1967. And the following staff members have announced their retirement, uh, effective as of the date of uh, the end of their contract. 
and that's Beth Boyer, teacher of physical education, James Ferency, teacher at Dow High School, Mike McKenna, teacher of physical education, Joe Pocock, teacher of industrial arts, Ted Zook, emer emergency medical technician, Cliff Holsinger from Grounds, Ruth Ann Dow, a driver with transportation, Kathy Bloomfield, paraprofessional at Eastlawn, Helen Henley, paraprofessional at Woodcrest, Rebecca Malkin, paraprofessional at Central Middle School, Cheryl Worley, paraprofessional at Woodcrest, and lastly, Diane Woodcock, paraprofessional at the post-secondary program. Thank you, Mr. Berlindi, uh, and our condolences uh, to the family uh, in their loss. I'll also say that uh, we've lost uh, a little bit of uh, senior teacher and staff members in that, uh, in that, in that retirement, so uh, best wishes to them. So with that, uh, we'll move on to uh, 9.1 letters uh, to and from the Board of Education are posted or in your agenda. And uh, scheduled attend is a schedule of activities. We're all aware of the meetings uh, and the special meeting in May, um, on May 29th. And so uh, we will start with study discussion. I would just caution my fellow board members to be um, short and direct, as we probably have a very lengthy um, closed session meeting after this meeting. So with that, I'll start with my to my right with Angela. Short and direct. Thank you, everyone who came and spoke tonight. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> so, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming too. I think it's important for the board to hear from people who are affected by decisions the board makes. So thank you for coming and presenting your concerns to us. I would echo the, the same thing. We always appreciate hearing from you and, and hearing your personal statement. So um, hopefully we, we can all get this resolved very soon. Um, on another note, congratulations to the um, Midland High girls basketball game, uh, um, their team. What a hard-fought battle the other night. I was there and enjoyed it, and it was one of those gut-wrenching games, and unfortunately, the three points went the other way. But uh, they have a lot to be proud of. It was just amazing to watch what these girls have accomplished. And as well as all the other sports teams, I actually went through the paper before I came tonight, and there's a lot of uh, honors and, and um, the area sports teams uh, have some recognition and uh, coach Mahabir from Midland High is coach of the year so congratulations to all of them and uh, last time when Dow High was here with the symphonic band they gave us the CD and it's in my car and I would like to just say that I've had a chance to listen to it and congratulate and com commend uh, Steve DeReese and that group it, it is just phenomenal I put it in for a friend the other day whose uh, children have graduated from Midland High and she just was amazed. They were musicians. And uh, so congratulations again to them. And this isn't really school, but today, for those of us that have been involved with Girl Scouts for many years, it's their 100th birthday. And I, I um, spent, have spent many years involved with that. But thanks to the schools and, and the staff that help us, because a lot of meetings and activities and, and um, as someone mentioned earlier, you know, the, the uh, building managers help us set up for a lot of those events. And uh, so that's been, a, that's been a lot of years and a lot of hours. And I think lastly, on these gifts to Northeast, I'm kind of dating myself because I remember Mr. Malkai. And when uh, my kids, when we moved to Midland and my kids went to Northeast, I looked at that sink, and it was the same sink that I remembered. And um, so I can see that it has probably seen its better days. So. <laughs> And um, just, I always find it very interesting, the variety of gifts. But that one, that one has got to be one of the, the most unusual. So. You would almost have to see that thing to appreciate yep. why this is such an honor to have a new one there in someone's name. It looks like a piece of artwork almost. It's got so much uh, color and design on it. So, but thanks to all our donors. Those are great, great gifts. All right. Uh, I'm just hearing uh, updates about the uh, joint fundraising effort for the booster clubs uh, with the booster bash. I, I know they were at uh, one of the elementary carnivals and, uh, and 50s uh, dance nights, and I'm hearing they're getting up to some pretty big numbers, and it's really exciting to hear the community get behind uh, that joint uh, fundraising effort and uh, appreciate the community getting behind that. It shows that Midland can definitely uh, step up, rise to the challenge, and be able to provide good things for the kids. It's really exciting to hear that. Um, 
Also, thank you to everybody who spoke tonight. I mean, it's good to know how these changes affect you. Um, you know, I, again, the point that we're at with this, and I said it last uh, board meeting, uh, before the fact finder report came out, I think it's an opportunity for us to be able to uh, turn the corner and be able to look toward the positives. And, uh, and I just think of our last board meeting, we had uh, a lot of uh, great uh, achievement that was reported in our, our test scores the MEEP, ACTs, and just to thank all of you for your part that you did with that. We really are appreciated. Um, and uh, that's all I have. Uh, real quickly, I just wanted to, uh, I just came back from spring break because we're on a different schedule. My kids obviously in college, and I was amazed when I read about the fire at Northeast, and um, many of us have spent many time at Northeast. So I just wanted to appreciate everybody from the person who found the fire to everybody that's helped with the road to recovery, I guess, doing it, and all the inconvenience. So I'm, I'm really sorry everybody had to go through that. Um, I also want to kind of um, put an um, uh, accolade in and uh, invite everybody to come to the Booster Bash and everything. That's a great event for all of us. We talked about that a lot last time, so looking forward to that. I um, also wanted to congratulate all of the sports teams that went through their kind of postseason tournaments and especially want to do a shout out for the Dow High Swim team. I mean, there are juggernauts and there are juggernauts, and Dow High Swim has been a juggernaut for years and years and years, and I know we had a couple state champions that came out of it, and the whole team did a wonderful job. Just want to shout out to them. And I also wanted to kind of thank all of you that are still here tonight that spoke to us tonight. Um, we really need to hear from you. We enjoy hearing from you, and we understand that things are, are really hard, and it's good for us to hear that directly from you. We recognize we make decisions here that impact people, and we understand that the, the governor makes decisions. Legislature, we all make decisions in the government that impact people, and it's, it's hard. It's really hard. But I appreciate your thoughtfulness. I appreciate your... Uh, heartfelt, sincere kind of comments to us, really do. And quite frankly, it was very nice to see some of you, because many of you that spoke tonight have impacted one or more of my four kids. And I uh, need to do a shout out to your beard, Mark. That's a pretty impressive beard. I just want you to know that. <laughs> it's a beard, man. It's a real beard. So thank you. Appreciate everybody's support and everything you do for our district every single day. So that's all I have. Well, I call it, try to keep it, uh, as I've asked uh, uh, everybody to keep it brief. Um, but I want to say to those who spoke this evening, uh, we are listening. And I you know that oftentimes between the um, uh, things that go on here, it's difficult to understand or to see that. And it, you think we sit up here stone face and don't care about what, what we're doing and how it impacts you. And I can tell you it's just the opposite. Quite contrary, in fact, that uh, we know how, it, how we're impacting everybody. And if you, you know, the gentleman earlier asked us to look in the mirror. Well, we not only look in the mirror, but we have many sleepless nights based on what we have to do up here. We hope that we can, we've uh, gone around that curve with respect to how the state handles our, our, our school aid and that things can change. Um, but we do listen and we do care. And I know that that's oftentimes not uh, thought, on, uh, thought about, but uh, um, I, again, thank you for all of, all of that you shared with us this evening. It's very important to us. And so uh, with that, uh, Mr. Wasserman, you joined us, and I know you don't feel well. If, uh, if with that, uh, if we have anything else, we'll go to Mr. Ellinger and uh, go to closed session shortly. Just to uh, always end our meetings with a focus on the students that we all serve. Um, Middle and High Varsity Hockey Team, congratulations to them. They're Saginaw Valley League. Uh, champs and they had an undefeated league season so that's pretty incredible a shout out also we've heard about the Dow High swim team I don't think any of us have mentioned yet that Gary Strickler is once again I don't know how many times the uh, coach of the year for swimming of the league so that's a nice honor for him and reflects well I think on, on all of us uh, but most especially uh, the, the, the student athletes um, general recognition for Jefferson Middle School. Congratulations to the 8th grade band on their outstanding performance on Saturday, March 3rd at the District Festival. They were one of three groups all weekend to, to receive straight Division I ratings um, all weekend. That's pretty incredible, uh, even for a band that gets uh, mostly ones when they go. Uh, we talked about Midland High Girls Varsity being SVL champs, undefeated in league season play, winning their third district title in school history and for advancing to the regional finals for the second year in a row. I know that was great disappointment to um, those kids and um, Elaine and, and that building, but you know what, when they get some perspective and some time, they'll realize that will turn out to be, especially for the students, one of the most special times of their lives, and they'll reflect on that for the next 70 years. So pretty incredible to see that happen. Thank you. Anything else from my peers up here this evening. If not, we will stand and uh, close our public session, go into our open session in five minutes. <laughs>